Um, the exhibit that many of you have seen that contains our work attempts to put a different epistemological base under Talbot County history and Eastern Shore history. And that's the most important thing that's coming out of all of this. It attempts to say that slavery, racism, and the violence of both can be seen as a part but not the whole of this area. Using the materials excavated by archaeology and understood through anthropology, there is a history and a unified present that owner and enslaved made for 200 years, maybe 250, while one strived for profit and survival and the other strove for freedom and survival. Our research, which is illustrated both here and in the exhibit, shows censuses of slaves but with whole names, remains of animal bones used for food, pollen from useful plants, and knowledge of slave landscapes to show the origins of a determination to be equal, self-sufficient, African, and whole in the face of endless bondage. Therefore, this essay in our exhibit is part of the literature that addresses slavery in one way, but not in the famous way. The famous way <clears throat> is created by what's created by Frederick Douglass. He describes an institution so wicked that it had to be eliminated. The other way, ours, acknowledges the wickedness of slavery, but it sees all, hum but sees all humans as cultural and therefore as creators of systems of meaning that guarantee survival. Language, religion, music, dance, cuisine, which is what this is all about, medicine, which is inside this lecture, and aesthetics, which is the difference between the gardening traditions here. Our data and our discipline direct us to this second way. So this is the value of anthropology connected to our... That's the first question. That's the easy one. Um, then, how is this greenhouse and its garden tied to the African-American gardens immediately adjacent to our lives in Easton? That is to say, right outside the door of this building. The second question means, how is your garden, yard, and field here on the eastern shore tied to African-American yards across the street and down the road? Our unifying theme is the order of plants made on the eastern plant use made on the eastern shore by people of African descent and people of European descent when one was enslaved and the other the owners of them. Here we have two gardening traditions, two peoples gardening together, however involuntarily, and two living gardening traditions today in sight of each other, but with one not recognizing the second and the second not wanting recognition. That's what I think we need to challenge. However, it took both to make each work so successfully, I think. We used two ideas to show how the greenhouse worked and thus how gardening traditions here came to take the forms that they do and that you can actually go out and see. Our secondary point is that the greenhouse that remains at Y was one of many and that what we describe here is the result of a hypothesis that could be applied to any of the surviving farming landscapes on the eastern shore. That's the dozens and hundreds of plantations that exist and many of which still have, are there in remnant forms around the shores of the bay. And the large number of African-American descendant communities in those neighborhoods and in our neighborhoods, and many of you know them. We begin with pollen analyses and then move to the idea of a floral clock, but the unifying idea is about the use of plants and virtually any one of you who cares either about the weeds in the lawn or a garden will understand this stuff and really relate to it. Most plants, and po most plants produce pollen <coughs> and most archaeologists collect pollen samples carefully from the pits we excavate. When Richard and Beverly Tillman invited us to excavate in the Y greenhouse, I was frankly amazed and I took the opportunity. There was never any doubt that we would dig as little as possible in the south room of the greenhouse because it is a unique environment. Um, there was never any doubt either that we would collect pollen samples and have them analyzed. The excavations were at Y were done by Matt Cochran, John Blair, and Stephanie Dunzing. You know they'd kill me if I didn't mention their names. Um, <laughs> the analyses were actually done in Boston, and we need to import that here, by Heather Trigg and Susan Jacobucci, both archaeologists and palynologists of the Fifth Center for Archaeological Research at the University of Massachusetts in Boston. That's the last time I'm going to mention Boston. The plant photograph, the plant, the pollen graphs are on display in the exhibit and on our loop here. Um, they are hard to read, okay, but they're easy to understand. Um, they show three important things. <clears throat> the 
plants on the south room of the greenhouse, that's the one with the great windows, and it's the one that faces the sun, are different from those in the slave quarter built on the north side of the greenhouse. There are more medicinals, comestibles, and utilitarians in the slave quarter. Second, there were over a hundred species of, and families of plants in both the south room and in the quarter. So this is a greenhouse with lots and lots of plants in it. Thus the greenhouse rooms were a pivot, a center, a nexus of plant populations and use. It wasn't about oranges. Not that they weren't there. Um, that is a mistake. Third, there is a mix of domesticated and wild plants in the pollen and therefore in the greenhouse. The greenhouse is not the result of John Bartram's seed catalog. It is not about rarity, delicacy, or tropicals. It is about the mix of the catalog and the forest and the swamp. Therefore, we suggest the greenhouse with its controlled temperatures, and they were, and watering is an exper and its, its use of temperatures and watering is an experiment station in the new fashion sense of an agricultural experimentation, which involves figuring out greater productivity for the plants available regardless of their source, and it's the regardless of their source that is new. Therefore, we wonder if we could, if, if what we deal with is a local source, but one of dozens, if not hundreds, <clears throat> of potential domestication. This would be the conscious genetic manipulation of mutations available in any plant population anywhere on Earth, which, if managed through natural selection or Mendelian style, could produce a local variety of a species that was of greater use or quality or productivity. It will take a lot of expertise to pin this identity of domestication of particular species on local greenhouses, but th it is worth it if what we want to do is change gardening's identity on the eastern shore. In archaeology, in my field, in other words, there are three big questions. How did we evolve? How did we domestic wild plants, domesticate wild plants and animals? And how did cities occur? The emergence of culture and consciousness is by all odds the most important. Even so, our intent here is um, to position the Lloyd family use of scientific gardening next to harvesting the woods and the swamps of everything that anybody thought was useful. We put that process then into their hothouses, garden plots, two greenhouses, and the experimental efforts <clears throat> of the day, which are well recorded here by Stephen Bordley, just a few miles north of here on my island, and he and his daughter wrote two, book, two long books of this that are still in print, and introduced human selections, human selection as an antidote, not as an antidote, but as an adjunct to natural selection of the productive parts of plants and come up with the possibility of the propagation of a mutant form that was actually useful. Once that is a viable hypothesis then, and this is the key for us who have a lot of affection for the Eastern Shore, who gets the credit? The people who did the work, well, who did the work? That's for those to decide who write a new and different history of Talbot County. And that's what the exhibit is about. That's what our work at Y is about. That's what our work on the Hill is about, and that of Professor Dale Green. And that's what the entire apparatus we're bringing here from the University of Maryland is about. Part of the answer has to come from knowing how the work of religion, and here we mean spirits, magic, but for Christians, grace and prayer affects the use of external and internal cures. Now, I'm going to move now to medicine, but medicine in the context not of magic, but of belief. The African-American tradition of hoodoo, which is a religion, um, North American hoodoo, um, and one of its practices known as conjure, um, was not divorced completely from medicine until the 1940s and the 1950s. Therefore, we can begin to think that in the herbal healing tradition we are describing through our work with the pollen of the Y greenhouse is active in understanding that if good herbs cure the head, then the body will heal itself. Therefore, we do not see slaves, we see, we see conscious African traditions. Um, you can see this in the Silvered Virgin Marys in the middle of Easton. And you can see that anywhere in DC once you start looking. In, um, in um, Eastport, there's one on the ground and it's painted black. 
Um, so what is left, so the question is, what is left of the healing power going on there and with those spirits in near your neighbor's downspout? It's white. That is the healing spirit uh, that survives. And I don't know if the medical part does, and I doubt that it does. The case for short, shared or joint heritage regarding plant use at White House comes from establishing an active American presence in the past. That is in our first hypothesis and comes from excavated remains of domestic life in the northwest room of the greenhouse, which archaeology shows to have been a living quarter, that is to say a slave quarter, from about 1790 to about 1840. People lived there because the crockery is inexpensive and not matched, and the people probably, but were not inevitably, were slaves. Second, there are two African-American bundles that date to the same time this environment, in other words, in the house, in the greenhouse. One was at the threshold of the living quarter, and that's on display in the exhibit. The other was at the apex or the keystone of the vault and the brick furnace that provided the heat uh, to the greenhouse, and that's in the display in the exhibit as well. The prehistoric pestle, reused, because, reused from its prehistoric creation, it was used because of its glint and therefore its connection to light and fire, and is also be part of an African-American usage. These two bundles, are part of West African religions, religions and deities that called forth the spirits through fire, forging light. This logic leads to the work of the greenhouses as Europeans would see it. So this is a different take, one that is far more familiar. Late 18th century inventories count a water pump and a thermometer in the greenhouse at Y. The pollen shows large numbers of plants of many different requirements for temperature and water in the greenhouse, and therefore the need for different degrees of heat and cool and wet and dry conditions, all for propagation. The image we want to build on, but to fix, is Douglas's note that the abundant gardens of Edward Lloyd Four were supervised by imported Scots gardener, Mr. McDermott, attended by four slaves. Mr. McDermott has an identity, even though it's minor. He had one for the slaves, and to them, rather. Um, from the slave censuses, we have their names. The Lloyds recorded, the Lloyd records, or censuses that are here, many of them are here, list four enslaved gardeners in 1796, before Douglas's time, but perhaps surviving until he arrived. They were named Big Jacob, Little Jacob, Kit, and Stephen. And we know more about their lives than we did before. As a consequence, Kit and Stephen were middle-aged at the end of the 18th century, but the two Jacobs were young and may have been assistants to Mr. McDermott half a generation later. They were experienced scientific gardeners, not subordinates, but experts. Anyone working in something so precise as the greenhouse, the formal gardens, the orchards, and the fields at a place like White House is going to have precise knowledge and to use it. A person will know soils, and all of you who are gardeners, this is anything that you would pull out of anything you would say at the hardware store while buying tulip bulbs. Now, this time of year, soils, temperatures, water requirements, fertilizers, seeds, drainage, potting, planting, weeds and weeding, trimming, timing, as well as the times needed and kept by plants. All of that, when you think about it, is easy, but it's precise. This person will be a gardener. However, there are three or four more precise elements such a gardener will know and will use. One is use of plants, another is rhythm, that is to say the rhythm of plants, and a tie to the cosmos. Why is the plant here? Why did God create it? What is its purpose, in other words? The latter is the answer to why the plant exists. The association between the supernatural and the natural was known well to Europeans. In the development of scientific gardening in the 17th and 18th centuries, Italian botanical gardens were also a place for spirits, as well as to understand why God made the world. The gardens connected to monasteries and early universities were for study, of course, that's what we think, um, but also for religious iconography in the garden and as a way of understanding creation. It was oriented using a relationship to the cosmos and designed in order to capture and express the four elements, 